So let's do some rocket science. I'm Daniel. I'm a rocket scientist by profession. And uh, I dare you to think big for a few minutes. So the sky is actually not the limit. Um, we often think that. Uh, but as Germans, as Europeans, we often also tend to think small in our um, confined spaces. Um, this is definitely not uh, the way when you can think small. This is a very good picture of humanity. Kind of uh, includes the entire Earth, the entire um, width uh, of, uh, of humanity and what humanity can offer. And when we think of space, we often also think of something like this. This is about the orbit that the International Space Station is doing every 90 minutes of Earth. So every 90 minutes, the International Space Station is going around Earth one time at roughly a 400 kilometer altitude. And actually, we all are in space. Um, so this is uh, in uh, relation Earth to, on the right side, there's the moon. Maybe you can't even see it anymore in the back. Um, but actually, we're all floating through space uh, on Earth. And space is quite big, um, so you also have to think big. Um, this is about Earth in relation to our sun. And our sun is not the only one in, uh, in our system, in our universe. Um, so when you look up at the night sky every evening, every night, this is about what you see. Sometimes you see it better, sometimes you see a bit less. Um, but actually, every star you see is more or less a sun. Um, and just within our Milky Way, within our galaxy, there's about 100 billion stars. So when you have an argument next time with your neighbor about cropping a tree, think of it that maybe it's actually quite a small argument compared to where we are with humanity. And if you go even bigger, these are all galaxies. So just within our own galaxy, there's about 100 billion stars. And depending who you talk to, in our entire universe, there's about between 200 billion and 2 trillion galaxies. So there's actually quite a lot of stuff going on in the entire universe. And this is one side of space. And the other side of space actually is earthbound space. space. It's commercial space. Um, so the space industry today is about a 400 billion industry every year. And when we think of commercial space, this is what we really mean. How many people of you got here today by GPS? So that's at least half of you. Um, probably it's more like 98%, I'd guess. But GPS actually is nothing else than just satellites. So once you get a GPS signal, you get a signal from four satellites simultaneously on your phone, directly from the satellite. And when we also think of space, for example, such as TV satellites, you see the TV satellites are floating around Earth at a distance of 36,000 kilometers. Why 36,000 kilometers? Because at this altitude, the speed of the satellite is just so that the satellite goes around Earth once per day, meaning it turns around with your position on Earth, which is also the reason why your satellite dish is pointing at the same position every time, because the satellite is turning with you around. And when you think of new business models, for example, such as internet through satellites, you might think, this might be nice, but I don't want to wait a minute or uh, actually it's not a minute, but it's really just about half a second uh, for an internet page to load. So engineers came up with satellite constellations. So instead of having one big satellite the size of a school bus and costing for about $500 million per satellite, what companies and startups as of today build are small satellites the size of a beer crate and costing just a few tens of or hundreds of thousand euros. And you span them around a mesh uh, around Earth uh, because, again, orbit time at 500 kilometers altitude is just 90 minutes. So in order to do global coverage, you need to cover the entire area of Earth with hundreds or even thousands of satellites. Let me give you a very quick example of what you can do with very small satellites. Um, imagine you have a mesh of tens or uh, hundreds of satellites, and you take an image of every ship worldwide every minute, let's say. 
And you take all of these images, and you put an AI on top to say which ones of the ships are oil tankers, for example. And then, because you know the position of an image you took and the time you took the image, and out of the image you also uh, extract the size of the shadow of the ship, you can determine exactly how much oil there is on the ship. Because if there's more oil on the ship, the ship is actually going more into the water, and the shadow is getting smaller. And now imagine doing that real time, monitoring the entire oil stream worldwide on ships. And this is just one of the examples where engineers start to get really, really crazy and do crazy stuff, which is also why we like to think the space industry and commercial space today is like the internet 20 years ago. And all of that is being done with small satellites. This is actually a CubeSat. It's just a standardized satellite, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters small, fully functional satellite that costs about $50,000 in production. Again, compared to a TV satellite the size of a school bus, 500 million per piece, built once. And when it's cheap, you can do satellite constellations. So you just build hundreds or even thousands of them, so you really get a global coverage. And you put different sensors on different satellites. Um, you might do an infrared camera on your satellite telling you when is the best time to harvest your crop. This is actually being already done today. And everything is fueled, of course, by investments. Um, so what you see here is private investments, cumulative, globally into the space industry, into space ventures. And if you compare that over the last few years with governmental budgets, it's actually not looking that bad anymore. So really, private investments and private investors are taking the risk on for space ventures because it just offers so many possibilities and opportunities that they are now funding the same, more or less, than the uh, governmental industries. And because of that, with ESA Aerospace, we're building an entirely newly designed rocket to bring all of these satellites to space. So the rocket is a two-stage rocket. It has a payload capability of about one ton. If you compare that to a Falcon 9 from SpaceX, which has about 20 tons of payload capability, it's just fairly small. But then again, the satellites are not as huge as TV satellites anymore, the size of a school bus. But we're just launching tens and hundreds of beer crates. Um, so this is why you actually need small and flexible and also low-cost rockets. On top of that, we thought, how can we really make an impact? Um, because rocket industry actually is very old. So 50, 60 years um, started in the Second World War when the first rockets were developed. Um, so we, th we said, how can we make this uh, sustainable. And so we actually chose a new fuel type that has never been used before on an orbital launch vehicle, however, has been tested to be functioning quite well. Um, it's a light hydrocarbon, and with a light hydrocarbon, we can actually cast our CO2 and soot emissions by about 40% compared to kerosene, which is quite a big deal because you put all of that emissions into the higher atmosphere of Earth where they actually stay forever. And actually, the the fuel with our oxidizer, liquid oxygen, um, is burning so clean that we actually run into problems for cooling our combustion chamber. Because at a combustion temperature of about 3,500 degrees within the rocket engine, you have to somehow thermally insulate the rocket engine. And the soot that is forming, for example, with kerosene is actually a good insulator. So we came up with a 3D printing technology um, we're using uh, selective laser melting for that to actually 3D print our rocket engines entirely. And we can generate very, very complex three-dimensional geometries and optimize our fuel and uh, our cooling systems within the rocket engine combustion chamber such that actually the rocket engine can take the heat. On top, it also enables a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, time spent. Um, so uh, a complete rocket engine at ESA Aerospace uh, is being produced every week, whereas if you compare it to classical manufacturing, it's about every nine months. Um, so there are a few, uh, a few advantages down the road. And you might think, actually, 
space is something that NASA does. Space is something that SpaceX does. It's something that the Americans do. It's something that the Chinese do. Uh, but what about us Europeans? Actually, a lot of the space history we have worldwide is coming out of Germany. Um, just a quick example. Professor Ruppe was a professor at the Technical University of Munich. He actually was the guy to decide that the Saturn V that launched humans to the moon, he was the guy who said Saturn V is going to have five engines on the first stage. Um, previously, it was four engines. And uh, he convinced Werner von Braun, the chief engineer, by the way, also a German one, to actually put five rockets on the engine, which uh, afterwards succeeded very well. So Professor Schmucker then, in the 60s, uh, founded a rocketry research group called VAR at the Technical University of Munich, where we also spun out of uh, 50 years later. And uh, Professor Schmucker was, was already a student at Professor Harry Ruppe. So we're actually combining a lot of this um, historic space know-how into a new space company, trying to find completely new ideas on how you can build sustainable launch services and how you can build also companies that offer commercially viable space products. And this might also be something that you didn't know. But actually, the globally, the very, very first rocket company in the entire world was a German company. In the 70s, there was a company called Otrak, which was a very German name, Orbital Transport und Raketenaktiengesellschaft, who built the first rocket commercially. Um, in the end, it was shut down politically. There's a film um, for, for the entire Otrak story. It's called Fly, Rocket, Fly. I highly recommend the film. Um, but actually, what stayed um, from the entire rocket pioneering is that you do a lot of the rocket engineering and testing in the hinterland. So not just in Bielefeld, there's hinterland, but there's also a lot of hinterland in Bavaria, actually. So this is one of our test sites um, on a, uh, on a uh, very, very abandoned uh, area, actually, where we test our rocket engines and components for our rocket engines. If you're lucky, you might even spot a star tractor there. Uh, it's very rare, um, but this is actually how you do space. And it's not just NASA does space, and it's like this huge thing that no one else knows anything about. Actually, there's a lot of know-how and history in the German ecosystem. So my call to you today is be courageous. Um, about two years ago, we were three founders. We did some PowerPoint engineering. We had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. Um, two years later, we raised nearly $20 million in venture capital to build actually Europe's most powerful privately developed rocket. Um, how do you go from A to B? Well, you just break it down from a very big vision to smaller steps and smaller steps until they get digestible. And you just go from one work package to another work package. You build a team. You raise funds, in that case, for a very um, financially intensive venture. Um, but this is just a sign that it's possible to do so, even in Germany. We thought a lot about going into the US just for building our company because of fundraising, but then again decided to stay here in Germany because we like Germany, we like Europe. Uh, also, we try to resemble that somehow in our company name with ESAR Aerospace showing our roots to the German ecosystem. And so this is our responsibility. It's not just about um, being environmentally friendly, but it's also about bringing business models to other parts of the world, for example, where other people might benefit from it. Think of it, there's a few companies, actually, that are trying to offer internet directly through satellites, starting by the end of this year, actually. So it's not something, again, that is five or 10 years away, but it's actually happening right now. And think of the impact something like this could make if you offer internet through satellite to an entire continent such as Africa that has barely any ground infrastructure. So they're just jumping over to a technology where they can now have internet directly in any space, in any area worldwide, um, including uh, the desert, actually. Um, and you can really make an impact on other people, on other areas around the world 
Um, so space really gives a lot of opportunities. Um, it's also a lot of responsibility we need to take. So the entire societal uh, backbone actually is dependent on the technological side, on space topics. Um, so be courageous, think big, and uh, don't get yourself into very, very small topics. Um, but actually, uh, also big things can be done in Europe, in Germany. Thank you very much.